Headlines. The two Koreas failed to make a breakthrough in their military talks, a first in seven years. But Seoul tries to keep the dialogue going, offering a date for the already scheduled high-level talks. The Bank of Korea cuts the key rate by 25 basis points and trims its growth outlook for this year and the next. And Hong Kong police arrest 45 pro-democracy protesters in an effort to stop demonstrators from reoccupying a major road outside the government headquarters. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Coming to you live from Seoul, I am Kang Tae-ri. Top military officials from South and North Korea held talks today, but uh, Seoul's defense ministry confirmed, which confirmed this uh, secretive meeting, um, said no major breakthroughs were made, but little else has been disclosed. Our Hwang sung tells us what we do know. The two Koreas held a secretive round of military talks on Wednesday in attempts to ease tensions in their border regions. Seoul's defense ministry said general-level officers met at the truce village of Panmunjom after Pyongyang proposed the meeting last week. North Korea demanded three things, that South Korean vessels steer clear of the maritime border, that the South Korean government keep activists from flying anti-Pyongyang leaflets across the border, and that the media stop slandering the North Korean leadership. In response, South Korea said Pyongyang must respect their de facto maritime border in the West Sea and that the government cannot stop the spread of the leaflets and restrict the media since South Korea is a liberal, democratic society. Last week, South and North Korean patrol boats exchanged fire after a North Korean vessel crossed the de facto maritime border in the West Sea. Three days later, the two Koreas exchanged gunfire across their shared border after the North fired at South Korean balloons carrying anti-Pyongyang leaflets. The defense ministry said Wednesday's meeting was kept secret due to escalating military tensions following the recent clashes. But no concrete agreement was reached, with no date set for their next meeting. Meanwhile, the unification ministry confirmed that it proposed to the North on Monday the date for their planned second round of high-level talks. The ministry said South Korea offered to meet on October 30th at Panmunjom, but is still waiting for a response from the North. Kwang sang Arirang News. President Bakune has arrived in Italy to attend a biennial meeting between Asian and European leaders. During her five-day trip there, she will also have a chance to promote her diplomatic policies, uh, including how to deal with North Korea. Arirang's Chu Sun, who is traveling with the president, sends this report from Milan. President Bakune will attend this year's summit of the Asia-Europe meeting, better known as ASEM, starting Thursday. Here, the South Korean president plans to garner support from some 50 world leaders for her so-called Eurasia Initiative, which aims to link energy and logistics infrastructure across the continent to lay the foundation for new growth opportunities in both Asia and Europe. And by having North Korea participate in the initiative, President Bak anticipates the reclusive regime will eventually open up to the world and nuclear development and thereby set the stage for a peaceful unification of the peninsula. Also at the two-day summit, the Korean leader will talk about her country's future contributions as a key middle power in politics, the economy, society and culture. Ahead of the global gathering, President Bak will meet with Korean and Italian business leaders to pledge support for stronger economic cooperation between the two sides. She will hold a luncheon with Korean residents in Italy to emphasize how they can better bridge the two sides, reflecting on Seoul and Rome's 130 years of diplomatic relations this year. On the sidelines of the ASEM summit, President Bak is scheduled to meet several world leaders, including Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. During that meeting, the South Korean president will likely highlight China's role in persuading North Korea to lay down its nuclear arms and to revive dialogue with the international community. Choi Yusan, Arirang News, Milan. 
Strained bilateral relations between South Korea and Japan may be heading to a new low. Despite South Korea's demand that Japan acknowledge its past wrongdoings, Tokyo keeps on saying that it had done nothing wrong. Kim Minji tells us more. The frosty ties between Korea and Japan are far from thawing. The Japanese government says it will actively promote that Japan has committed no sins when it comes to forcing women to serve as sex slaves during World War II. The statement made at a cabinet meeting on Tuesday is in response to a lawmaker's question about the Asai Shimbun newspaper's decision in early August to retract what are called erroneous articles published in the 80s and 90s about the sexual slavery issue. According to the statement, Japan will strengthen foreign communications so that its stance and handling of affairs receives a fair assessment by the international community. The move goes against Korea's demand that Japan acknowledge and show sincerity about its historical wrongdoings, particularly the sexual enslavement of women. The Seoul government also deplored on Wednesday that Japanese Foreign Minister Kishida Fumio a day earlier repeated Tokyo's claim to Korea's easternmost Dokdo Island, despite Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's administration's pledge to take steps to improve bilateral ties. Adding fuel to the fire, a top cabinet official who has spearheaded efforts to deny Japan's wartime sexual enslavement says she will visit a controversial war shrine that honors A-class war criminals. When time allows, I'll visit the Yasukuni Shrine. Japan's chief cabinet secretary, Yoshida Suga, said there's nothing wrong with paying respect to those who lost their lives while fighting for the country. With Korea and Japan on diverging paths, it seems highly unlikely that long-delayed bilateral summit talks will be arranged anytime soon. Kim min Arirang News. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world, join Kang Cheri for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8 every weeknight on Arirang TV. Korea's central bank has cut its key rate to a record low of 2 percent to give a much-needed boost to the slumping economy. The central bank's concerns over the economy was reflected in its uh, new growth forecast for this year, which was cut to mid-3 percent level. Our Hwang Jie has more. Lowering growth forecast for the economy, the Bank of Korea on Wednesday cut its key interest rate by a quarter of a percentage point to 2 percent. It's the second rate cut in just three months and marks a drop to the record low only matched at the height of the global financial crisis in 2009. BOK Governor EGR said the rate cut was necessary as economic sentiment remains sluggish at home while inflation stays lower than expected. The Monetary Policy Committee believes the two rate cuts, including the one in August, should help the domestic economy recover its growth momentum. In the face of the feeble pace of recovery, the central bank cut its new growth forecast for this year to 3.5 percent from an earlier projection of 3.8 percent. Although the new growth outlook for next year was trimmed by a mere 0.1 percentage point, the central bank said that does not mean the economy is stably back on a normal track. We expect the Korean economy to grow nearly 4 percent in 2015, but the growth will mainly come from the government's expansionary policy. The rate cut this month, however, stokes concerns the country's household debt that already stands at around 950 billion U.S. dollars could spiral out of control. Experts add that the domestic economy could face massive capital outflows with the historically low key rate in place while the U.S. Federal Reserve is tightening its monetary policy. Acknowledging such concerns, the governor said the central bank will closely monitor the risks stemming from the rate cut. He said although the recent rate cuts will help prop up growth, structural changes are critical for the longer term health of the economy. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. 
And also, do you know that、uh, the Bank of Korea has trimmed inflation forecasts for Korea for this year and the next? And here's a data point that could support the downgrade. Korea's import prices fell for the seventh straight month last month on weakening oil prices. The Bank of Korea says the import price index stood at 93 in September, the lowest level in five and a half years. The central bank also explained that、uh, the local currency weakened against the greenback. By 0.8 percent in September on month, but、uh, the price of Dubai crude shed more than 5 percent, dragging overall import prices down. And here's another economic data point out this morning: Korea's employment unemployment rate, that is, inched down in September, but the pace of job creation slowed to a three-month low. Statistics Korea says the jobless rate stood at 3.2 percent last month, edging down 0.1 percentage point from the month before. Some 450,000 new jobs were created in September, up around 2 percent on year, bringing Korea's employment. Employment rate to 61 percent. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg and his 40-member delegation spent the second day of their trip to Korea in Suwon, south of Seoul. Samsung Electronics says Facebook board members, including COO Sheryl Sandberg, stopped by at Samsung's key complex called Samsung Digital City in Suwon. Prior to that, on Tuesday, Zuckerberg met with Samsung Electronics Vice Chairman Lee Jae-yong. For two hours over dinner, there are、uh, no official details on yesterday's meeting, but industry watchers say they may have exchanged their ideas on possible production of Facebook smartphones and wearable virtual reality devices. We often talk about wearables as the next big thing, but for these wearable gadgets to really take off, their batteries need to go long, of course, and be wearable as well. Our Kim Young Gil reports on some of the Korean manufacturers working on new types of batteries that can bend, flex, and even roll. Samsung SDI has developed the world's first bendable and rollable batteries that can be integrated into smart wristband watches. We conducted thousands of bending tests, and there was no performance degradation in the charging capacity of the batteries. Samsung SDI also unveiled pin batteries that are identical in size to a drug capsule at just 3.6 millimeters in diameter. They can be used in a variety of wearable devices that require ultra-small batteries. Not to be outdone, LG Chem introduced cable batteries, which can be used to light up OLED monitors and small display panels. They can be bent and twisted, and are also waterproof. Cable batteries are suitable for powering wearable devices such as Bluetooth earphones, headphones, and can even be applied to various clothing materials. Both companies are also focusing on large-sized batteries, which can be used in electric vehicles. They say mass production on those will begin in the next few years. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. Korea has enjoyed a rapid spike in the number of Chinese tourists in recent years, and wants to make sure that the good times continue. The tourism ministry has announced a series of new measures and regulations to enhance the quality of services offered to visitors from China. They include investing in the development of new tour programs, systemizing smart tourism initiatives, and making sure there are enough affordable hotels to accommodate them. The government. Has also put to particular emphasis on improving the quality of Chinese-speaking tour guides as well. The total of Chinese tourists to Korea has grown at an average of 35 percent over the last five years. Obesity is a serious problem, of course, throughout much of the world. Unfortunately, Korea's overall obesity rate, especially among young boys, is increasing at a worrying pace and now surpasses the OECD average. Sun Jung-in has this report. Eight-year-old Sun Soo-min is heavier than most of his classmates. After a body checkup, his parents were told he has a body fat ratio twice the average for a boy his age. 
Like many kids in Korea, Soomin likes to tuck into calorie and carbohydrate rich food like white rice, red meat, and fast food, and doesn't get enough exercise. I like snacks and drinks. I like soda, like Coke. His mother wasn't aware of the consequences and just gave him whatever he asked for. I heard people say that fat children usually eat up being taller as adults. The problem has worsened in recent years. In Korea, one in four boys aged 5 to 17 are obese, which is slightly higher than the OECD average. What's more concerning is that well over half of those boys remain obese into adulthood and are at higher risk of becoming morbidly obese. Obesity can lead to a host of other health issues like diabetes, high blood pressure, and it can also increase the chance of cerebrovascular disease at a young age. Obesity is known to cause cancer, including colorectal cancer, breast cancer, as well as asthma, fatty liver, and other liver disorders. It also incurs great social costs in terms of medical expenses and loss of production. According to recent data, the socioeconomic cost stemming from child obesity in Korea amounts to 1.3 billion U.S. dollars each year. Child and teenage obesity not only affects the individual but their family, school and the community as a whole. Experts advise parents to create a friendly but firm atmosphere for their children and encourage them to exercise and eat fresh fruit and vegetables to maintain a healthier lifestyle. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. A one-of-a-kind gilt bronze statue of Buddha was recently returned to Korea, and it's now on display for the very first time. And for a very closer look, our Immuni takes us to this exhibition. Just this week, the National Museum of Korea unveiled a gilt bronze statue of Buddha that dates back to the late 8th or early 9th century, under the unified Silla era. And for the first time ever, this rare treasure is being put on public display. At 30 centimeters tall, the statue of Buddha resonates stylistic traits of that period, such as flat features and a big face, as well as a unique design, making this work truly one of a kind. There are jewels embedded within the halo of the figure, making this one of only two in the world and possibly the only one with jewels embedded in the base as well. Another treasure recently returned to the nation is now making its first public debut as well. The rare Koryo Dynasty lacquered suture box is thought to be one of only nine authentic specimens left in the world. With over 450 patterns of peonies, turtles and other shapes, the delicate wooden box is now part of the new exhibition, showcasing a compilation of prized treasures recently returned to Korea, including an illustration of the historical battle of Noryang, the final battle site of Korea's legendary Admiral Lee Sun Shin. Many of the items now on display were purchased by the museum or donated, but in the end, no price tag can match the historical value each one of these relics contains when it comes to Korea's history. Im Yoon Hee. Arirang News. Police in Hong Kong have continued to clash with the protesters for the second straight day now, resulting in the worst of violence since pro-democracy rallies erupted in the city more than two weeks ago. And Paul Lee, of course, is joining us from the News Center. Paul, uh, tensions have spiked in the wake of this uh, police crackdown. Uh, how did events play out between the two sides today? Well, the violent confrontations reignited early this morning as the police stepped up their offensive to clear the city's roads that have been blocked by activists for more than two weeks now. Officials reportedly used pepper spray and batons to disperse the protesters and arrested at least 45 people overnight. In a press briefing on Wednesday, authorities said some protesters were to blame for the escalation. None of those arrested have been injured and four of my officer colleagues were wounded. One officer was pushed over by some demonstrators and dislocated his right shoulder. Another officer was injured on the corner of his eye after being stabbed by demonstrators with umbrellas. We the police denounced the use of violence in any form. 
Activists and Hong Kong lawmakers are calling for an investigation into an alleged case of police brutality after a video was released of six officers beating an unarmed protester during the clash. Demonstrators are continuing to demand that Hong Kong have the freedom to pick its own chief executive in 2017, a move the incumbent chief says has almost zero chance of happening. Mm -hmm. Quite a different picture that we are seeing now. And in one of the latest developments in the Ebola crisis, a top UN official has warned that the world is losing the fight against this virus as it's continuing to spread across West Africa. And this call to action was actually directed squarely at the UN Security Council. How was the message received? Well, there hasn't been any concrete action yet, but a joint resolution is expected to be adopted in the coming days following the special session to discuss the Ebola crisis. Addressing council members on Tuesday, Anthony Banbury, the head of the UN's Ebola response mission, said the international community needed to redouble its efforts to send medical staff and supplies to West Africa. He warned that as long as there is a single case of Ebola, the virus would be a threat to all countries and all people. But if we do not get ahead of the crisis, if we do not reach our targets, and the number of people with Ebola rises dramatically, as some have predicted, the plan we have is not scalable to the size of such a new crisis. We either stop Ebola now, or we face an entirely unprecedented situation for which we do not have a plan. Meanwhile, health authorities in the U.S. state of Texas have confirmed that a second health care worker has tested positive for Ebola. The World Health Organization says if the viral outbreak continues on its current course, some 10,000 new cases per week are expected to arise by the end of this year. Mm. And seeing in the U.S., Paul, an emergency meeting of a defense chief from over 20 countries has uh, wrapped up in Washington to address the growing threat of uh, Islamic State militants in Iraq and Syria. And tell us what came out of this meeting. While well, addressing the defense chiefs at a military airbase on Tuesday, U.S. President Obama said he is very concerned about the Islamic State's assault on the Syrian border town of Kobani, as well as the Iraqi province of Anbar. He vowed U.S. military would keep launching airstrikes in the area, saying that the advance underscores the threat IS poses in the Middle East and abroad. Obama warned the coalition it would take a long-term campaign to destroy the extremist group and that the journey would involve progress and setbacks. Our nations agree that ISIL poses a significant threat to the people of Iraq and Syria. Uh, it poses a threat to surrounding countries. Uh, and because of the numbers of foreign fighters that are being attracted and the chaos that ISIL is creating in the region, ultimately it will pose a threat uh, beyond the Middle East, uh, including to the United States, Europe, uh, and far-flung countries like Australia. The U.S.-led coalition had reportedly conducted 21 aerial attacks on IS targets near Kobani over the past two days in support of Kurdish forces defending the town. The Pentagon said the bombings appear to have slowed the insurgents, but cautioned that the situation remained fluid. Mm. And finally, uh, the global tech giant Intel has beat market expectations in its latest earnings call on the back of recovering computer sales. This company has dominated pretty much the PC market for years, and it looks like they've struggled to even make a dent in the mobile space. That's right, and Intel's top executives are hoping this new venture will help turn things around. To give you an idea how, just how far behind they are, of the some 15 billion U.S. dollars of revenue that the company reported in the third quarter, only one million came from tablets and smartphones. According to Intel China executive W.K. Tan, the top chipmaker plans to release aggressively priced smartphones and also provide generous subsidies for tablet manufacturers that use its mobile technology. In response to declining sales and intense competition this past year, Tan predicts the future of mobile will be very bright. That's what we're seeing. And smartphones, I'm not, I'm not hearing any uh, drastic you know, a reduction or something like this. In fact, uh, we believe that the uh, entry value space will continue to, uh, to gain quite significantly. And as you can read, that some of the Chinese players are gaining places. In the, uh, in the worldwide so-called uh, smartphone or, or tablet ranking. Intel's mobile chief says consumers should start seeing a new range of tablets and smartphones powered by Intel chips by early next year, with prices starting at around $75 or lower. 
Market watchers are wary of this latest push after Intel's previous joint projects with Asus and Nokia failed to gain any ground. Cherry? All right, Paul, thank you so much for those stories. And we'll see you back here in just about two hours. Happy Wednesday, everyone. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with the weather updates. It was another chilly day here in Korea with the season's first frost reported in Daegwalyeong. Showers are in store tomorrow. The central regions, including Seoul, are looking at 5 to 20 millimeters, and Jeollabukdo and Gyeongsangbukdo provinces about 5 millimeters. At the moment, we are under fairly clear skies due to a high pressure system from China. The system, however, will move out overnight, leading to rainfall. Keep in mind that showers could could be accompanied by stormy conditions. Also, strong winds are expected for the west coast, western coast that is. And uh, make sure to make the most out of the weather while you can because another round of rainfall awaits us next week. On to the readings. Seoul and Gwangju reached 20, Busan 23. As for other regions, Daejeon hits 20, Jeju peaks at 21, Dokdo 18. That'll do it for now. I'll be back with more updates after 10. See you then. Thank you so much, Pogyang, and that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.